Hare Krishna. Welcome to the study of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. We are discussing text 2. The first text discussed how the Bhagavatam describes the Absolute Truth and the connection of the Absolute Truth with the rest of existence and how it is a meditation on a non-sectarian conception of the Absolute Truth. Now, in the next verse, in fact, in the next two verses, our first verse describes uh, uh, the Absolute Truth. Now, the second and third verses describe the way in which that Absolute Truth is conceived. That means, there are different ways in which one can ap approach the Absolute Truth. So, what is the way in which one is approaching? One can approach the Absolute Truth for material gains, one can approach the Absolute Truth for purification, one can approach the Absolute Truth for liberation, one can approach the Absolute Truth for pure love, for selfless service. So what is the reason, what is the mode, what is the consciousness in which the Bhagavatam is approaching and the Bhagavatam urges us to approach? That's what we will discuss now in the second verse. So that is discussed in the second and third verses. The first three verses are very important for setting up the stage of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Dharma Projita Kaitavotra Paramo Nirmat Saranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Shivastu Shivadam Tapatrayon Moolanam Srimad Bhagavatam Mahamuni Krite Kimva Parai Rishvare Sadyo Rudi Avruddite Atrakutibhi Shushru Shubhi Stachanat so, dharma projita, kaitavotra. Kaitava means cheating or deceptive. That which appears one way but is actually another way. So, what does kaitava dharma? Bhagavatam is saying dharma projahita kaitava. It is giving up kaitava dharma. This will be elaborated again repeatedly in the Bhagavatam but especially in 1.456, 5 and 6, the Narad Vyasa Samvad, which is foundational for understanding the distinctiveness, even the uniqueness of the Bhagavatam among the various literature in the world. So here it is said, Dharma Projahita Kaitava. So give up, Projahita means to give up completely. Uh, Shri Prabhupada would often translate this as kick out, sweep out with a broom, just dismiss completely. It's a strongly, uh, strongly communicative word of negation or rejection or dismissal. Dharma projahita kaitavotra. So in the, uh, it is rejecting kaitava dharma, the cheating religion, that's what it's talking about. Now what does this cheating religion refer to? Now, uh, normally what do we mean by cheating? You know, if we pay for a first hand uh, commodity, if I pay for a laptop, if I go to a showroom and say laptop costs 60,000 and it's supposed to be high class laptop and later on I find that it's a second hand laptop which I could have well got for 20,000. I say that person cheated me. That means I get less than what I should have got or what I could have got in exchange what I gave and what I could have got. It's much much lesser. So when we get less than the potential when we get then less what is fair, then that is what we call as cheating. So now dharma projita kaitava. Kaitava dharma means we get less out of human life by the practice of religion than what we could and should have. So human life is a platform for takeoff. It's a, a launching pad for catapulting us from the temporary world to the eternal world. And that transportation, that catapulting, that elevation happens for those who avoid the pitfall of materialism and even religious materialism. So materialism means we get attached to matter and material things and that's why we have to continue on in the samsara chakra. Religious materialism means that one focuses on enjoying material things but by religious means so in the Vedic scriptures there is this uh, four aspects of 
dharma, artha, kama and moksha. And they are important purusha arthas. Purusha artha, the purush word is used in an inclu gender inclusive way to mean both males and females. So artha, artha means purpose or goal. So purusha artha refers to that which is the purpose or, or, of life. So, mm, so the purpose of human existence is these four. One should do dharma, that itself is good and that will also lead to artha and that will lead to karma and then ultimately it will lead to moksha. This progression we will discuss again when we talk about from 1.2.6 to 22 the famous dharma verses. So on which the Lord Srila Prabhupada's book Dharma the way to transcendence based on the lectures that he gave on those uh, chap those verses. Uh, the most among the most oft quoted verses in the Bhagavatam. Now uh, that dharma artha kama which is basically religious materialism or material religiosity the end the difference between them is only in terms of words religious materialism means the emphasis on that uh, that one is still materialistic in one's conception one thinks of ourselves also of a, some sort of creature connected with the body and one thinks of bodily comfort and pleasure as the ultimate goal of life so one is at the material level of consciousness that is religious materialism and material uh, so the only in religious materialism the only addition is as differentiated from materialism is that one doesn't want to violate the principles of religion one uses those principles of religion to attain one's goals now, now material religiosity means that there is religiosity there is emphasis on the practice of religion okay one does some puja one does some pathan one does some Tirtha Yatra, one does these activities, but one's conception remains material. So, whatever is the noun is the emphasis. So, there is religiosity, but there is material religiosity. We will see the Bhagavatam condemns uh, material religiosity also has one level of animalism. So, it says that Tirtha Buddhi Salilayana Karachit Janeshu Abhigyeshu Saeva Gokharaha so a person who goes to holy places just to bathe in them and not to bathe in the wisdom that is coming from the lips of the great souls over there which a person is just like an animal now moving forward we see that here the Bhagavatam is focusing on dharma proj kaitava giving up kaitava dharma that means dharma artha kama which are primarily as I said religious materialism or material religiosity projahita cut them out and moksha is also at one level a liberation we know normally it means liberation but at one level, one level it is also the same self-centered level of consciousness where one thinks okay i i can't enjoy at the material level so let me just get rid of the enjoyment and then liberation in that sense i want to become the supreme enjoyer that is also in one sense wrong so dharma projaita kaitavotra paramo so paramo nirmat saranam satam so paramo is refers to the supreme transcendental the highest parama so nirmat saranam satam so by giving up the lower religion one practices the highest religion the highest religion is centered on love for love's sake so whereas dharma artha kama moksha this fourfold goals of human life are glorified in other religions the Bhagavatam says put them aside they are all cheating why because human life can give you something much more so if I put in hundred rupees and I can get something very valuable but instead of that I get something worth only one rupee then I have cheated myself so human life is something if we invest that in God then we can get eternal happiness in return but if we don't do that instead we just invest in even material religiosity in dharma artha kama then what we get is a temporary result we go to heavens kshine punne marte lokam vishanti one comes back again to the earth so it is not considered at all a glorious uh, result because it is under utilization of our potential similarly even liberation uh, 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 it is not it doesn't fulfill the heart's longing for love and one stays dissatisfied because one doesn't get a reciprocation so that's why just the impersonal liberation is uh, not something which devotees uh, look forward to but devotees uh, kaivalya narakayate Prabhupada Saraswati is a great Vaishnava 
mm, from the times of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he says that you know I find it hellish that liberation which is considered the supreme goal of life by many spiritualists a devotee considers real hellish because vina mat sevanam jana the couple they in his teaching the third canto says that if one does not get the opportunity to serve the lord then it is useless so now the parama dharma is talking about and what is nirmat saranam satam satam are those who are saintly so sata sat chitanand we know these are the three characteristics of the soul so sata refers to that which is eternal that it refers to the eternity feature of the soul and satam refers to those saintly people who are focused on the eternal not on the temple na sato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha ubhayor api drishtontas tvanayo sattva darshi bhi in 2.16 bhagavad gita it said na sato vidyate bhavo that that which is temporary that cannot be attained uh, though, though the, that which is eternal that has no destruction asato vidyate bhavo that is asata that is temporary it does not have any permanent existence it does not have to have any actual existence na bhavo vidyate sataha asata that is eternal that has no cessation it always continues to exist so satam are those who focus on the sata now there are many transcendentalists who focus on the sata but here a special characteristic of the transcendentalists nirmat saranam nirmat saranam refers to those who are non envious so those who are not competing with others at their level of enjoyment so at the material level there is always matsar because someone has more and someone has less and in fact the whole of one of the biggest impetuses for material life is um, comparing others possessions and trying to improve on them and often people consider that you know not only i attain things i become happy but after attaining things when i see envy in the eyes of others then that brings me a special joy so if i have a necklace if i have a dress if i have a car which is better than that of my neighbors my peers my colleagues then ah oh, that is the perfection of my life as the bhagavad gita also talks about this mentality in the description of the demoniac people the ungodly people 15.13 to 15 krishna says konyasti sadrsho maya who is there like me there's no one i am the best ishvaro aham aham bhogi siddho aham balwan sukhe i am the controller i am the enjoyer so nirmat sarana means one has just given up this whole business of material enjoyment and has no compet no envy because this doesn't have a competitive mentality one doesn't uh, get into this whole business of trying to grab more and uh, gain more and enjoy more at the material level so giving up the desire for material enjoyment is the way to rise uh, above envy and of course at the highest level it refers to uh, being free from envy for the supreme lord also because the supreme lord is the supreme enjoyer and as long as we want to enjoy like him then we stay in material existence so we want to enjoy not like him but enjoy with him by giving by serving him by giving him enjoyment so nirmat saranam satam so the bhagavatam will reveal the complete the highest level of nirmat sarya in its adoration of the ras lila where it offers it glorifies as the highest revelation of god and the highest uh, mode of devotion offering oneself completely to god and offering uh, to god all the enjoyments that people want in this world so the gopis offer themselves body mind heart everything to krishna and krishnendriya priti icha dhare prema naam so people want sense gratification over here and there it is sense gratification offered to krishna so that is the highest level of nirmat sar so the bhagavatam what it's going to teach it can be relished by these kind of people who are nirmat saranam and also by hearing the bhagavatam by hearing about these kind of souls how hearing about the supreme lord our mat sar will also go away 
Krishna also talks about is repeatedly anasu yave. Arjuna, I am speaking to this, speaking this knowledge to you because you are anasu yave. Idam tute guhiyatamam pravaksham yanasu yave. Nine point one, he says, this confidential knowledge. I am speaking because in all envious. And he also tells um, when he completes the Bhagavad Gita in eighteen point sixty seven, when he starts describing the falshuti, describe these to those who are non envious. Idam te na tapaskaya na bhaktaya kadachana na cha shushru shave vachim na cha maam yo abhisu yati. So don't speak this and he gives a list of categories of people and he says that among them abhisu yati. Those who are envious don't speak to them about this. So essentially the envy can be uh, generic when it's directed to people in general. It can be specific when it's directed towards a particular person and it can be also directed towards the Supreme Lord. So we may not be free from envy, but to the extent we are free from envy, to that extent we will be able to relish the Bhagavatam. And just by hearing the Bhagavatam, we will move towards freedom from envy and relishing it. This is the aspiration. So we are talking about what is the mode in which the Bhagavatam is urging us to approach. And that is Nirmat Saranam. And Vedyam Vastavam Avastu Shivadam Tapatrayon Mulanam. So it is offering us the vastava vastu vedyam come to know about it veda means knowledge vedya means to come to know about something so vastava vastu so come to know about the absolute truth vedyam vastavam atra vastu vastu is related to the vastava vastava is real vastu is that which actually exists truly so vedyam come to know about it vastava vastu come to know about the real truth so in one sense uh, the supreme absolute truth is the supreme reality and everything else is real but it is temporary it is temporal and in that sense it is not the supreme reality so the Bhagavatam shifts from uh, raises our consciousness uh, from the body to the soul from the soul to the Bhagavan and to his abode so he is the supreme reality and that is the object that we will be meditating on in the Bhagavatam now, our meditation shapes our destination. The, uh, this happens practically also. If I think about uh, eating, then I'll start feeling some hunger in my stomach. Even it will be often pseudo hunger. I'm not actually hungry, but I simply feel hungry because I am thinking about food that creates desire. And then what is my destination? I will go and I go to the kitchen and try to find something to eat. I'll go to a shop and purchase something. I will order something and some fast food person will come and deliver something at my home. So then I'll end up eating. So our meditation determines our destination. And this applies uh, also say if a person is a drunkard, this person will, if a person thinks of meditation, then the person will thinks of uh, drinking alcohol, the person will end up drunk. Now this applies at a much longer level, broader, longer level also. So yam yam va pismaran bhavam tijityante kalevaram tam tam evaiti kaunteya sadatad bhava bhavitaha so what krishna describes over here is that whatever we meditate on that's what we will attain in our next life whatever we think of in this life we will think of at the time of death what we think of at the time of death we will attain in the next life that's what krishna talks about in 8.6 and 7 so he says, what we think of, we'll attain at the time of that. That's 8.6. 8.7 says, therefore think of me, then you will attain me. So here, uh, what is the result of, the previous verse talked about dhimahi, meditate on the Supreme Lord. So this verse says, if we dhim, do dhimahi, if we meditate on the Supreme Lord, then what will happen? On that Supreme Lord, his vedyam, vastam atra vastu. So when we come to know about him, vastam atra vastu, Shivadam tapatrayon mulanam Shivadam Shiva uh, refers to a person as well as a condition so it's a condition of auspiciousness is Shiva and uh, the person who brings about that auspiciousness is also called a Shiva so the Vishnu Sahasranam refers to Lord Vishnu himself as Shiva Sarva 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 Shiva Sthanur Bhuta Dhir Nidhiravya so he's Shiva Sarva so he's auspicious. Now, one particular person who is especially meant, meant to bring auspiciousness in the life of the inauspicious, that is Lord Shankara. He especially is merciful to those in the mode of ignorance and he raises them. So he also has the name Shiva. So here, Shiva Dham. Dham means to give. 
so this will give us auspiciousness so for example if I'm sick and I get a medicine then that medicine brings auspiciousness in my life so here Shivadam this will bring auspiciousness what kind of auspiciousness Tapatrayon Moolanam Tapatraya the threefold miseries that are there Unmoolanam it will be uprooted ripped out completely thoroughly destroyed so that is even liberation it is not necessarily destroy the uh, disease completely because liberation removes our material desires but liberation does not in fact inject spiritual desires within us it is only bhakti that injects spiritual desires within us so it's like if you consider um, ordinate a y-axis then uh, uh, then liberation moves us from the negative axis to zero but it's bhakti which moves us from the negative axis to not only zero but beyond the positive axis so this is the supreme auspiciousness that our desires which cause us bondage and suffering in this world they if we direct them towards the supreme lord they will bring liberation that theme will be discussed in the next verse we'll discuss that but um, when you come to that verse but here the point is vedyam if we do vedyam the result of that will be tapatraya unmulanam unmulanam the uprooting of the tapatraya of the threefold miseries of material existence and the Bhagavad Gita in 4.9 also talks about this. If we come to know Krishna in true Tattvataha, here it is Vedyam, Bhagavad Gita is Tattvataha, Janma Karma Chame Divyam, Evam Yovati Tattvataha, Tektva Deham Punar Janma, Naiti Mame So it says that if we come to know about Krishna, then the result of that is we will not come back to the cycle of birth and death. So Tapatraya, Tapatraya refers to threefold miseries which are imminent and inevitable for everyone in material existence sooner or later you know the they are like three spears three or a three prong spear a threshold which pierces the heart and lives the hearts and lives of all living entities in material existence the adhyatmic adhibhautik and adhidaivik klesha so here but so the first line let's go back now the Bhagavatam will describe that religion, Dharma Projita Kaitavatra. So it will give up all lower levels of religion. And this level of religion is actually practiced and religion by the Nirmat Saranam Satam. It is Param, it is highest level of religion. What does it involve? It involves knowing the highest, knowing the true absolute truth. Vastam Atravastu, knowing the actual substantive principle, the substan true substantial reality. The ultimate substantive principle was the word which Bhaktisam Thakur would use to describe Krishna in his Brahma Samhita. So now, when, and what is the result of knowing that absolute truth? The result is that Thapatraya Unmulanam, all our miseries will be eradicated. And what is the result of that? Uh, or uh, what is further characteristic of that? Now, Srimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimva Parai Rishwaraha. So, Srimad Bhagavate. Srimad Bhagavata is such a glorious book. Uh, Shri Mad Bhagavata. This has various names. So the book itself often is called as Bhagavat Puran. That is a common name. Shri Prabhupada preferred to use Shri, preferred to use the word Shri Mad Bhagavatam. So mm -hmm. the Gaudiya Acharya also Sri Mahaprabhu also uses the word Srimad Bhagavatam as described in the first commentary within our tradition on the Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Manjusha. <laughs> So there is Pramana Amala. So Amala Puran or the Amala Praman. So Srimad Bhagavate. So that which is related to Bhagavan is called as Bhagavata. And Srimad, that which is filled with Shri, that is filled with wealth, opulence, auspiciousness, glory. So this is the book about Bhagavan which is filled with all auspiciousness. Srimad Bhagavate. Mahamuni Krite. Mahamuni Krite. So who is this Mahamuni? Now we understand that this is the invocation going on. So uh, this is this uh, different acharyas have explained differently. Now Jiva Goswami explains in his Krama Sandarbha. The Krama Sandarbha is like a commentary on the Bhagavatam, which is uh, he doesn't necessarily go into all the verses to comment on them, but he comments on important verses. And there he says that this verse focuses, uh, it refers to Nar Narayan Rushi and the second canto of Shemit Bhagavatam the different paramparas through which the knowledge of the Bhagavatam is coming is described so one such parampara 
is through Narnara and Rushi, it comes down. And that is also mentioned in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam when Narad Muni goes to Narnara and Rushi uh, and learns from him. Now we know in the Bhagavatam there is one more uh, tradition that is described that Krishna gives the knowledge to Brahma, Brahma gives the knowledge to Narada, Narada gives the knowledge to Vyasa and that's how it comes. That's one tradition. Now it's not that one cannot, one cannot learn from other traditions also. So Narada also goes and inquires from Narnara and Rushi. And Narnara and Rushi is also an incarnation of the Supreme Lord. So he is the Supreme Lord himself in one sense. So it is that great person who has compiled it. Now Mahamuni Krite can also refer to Vyasadeva. So now is it that Vyasadeva is referring to himself as Mahamuni? It may seem a little, uh, little odd for a person to glorify oneself like that. Now one understands that actually um, even, if, even if that is the case, that even if we say this is referring to Vyasadeva, then we understand that the, uh, law, uh, the devotee glorifies himself at all. It is not to, uh, not to glorify oneself, but to position one's message properly. Now, for example, Srila Prabhupada would write at the end of his purports, Bhakti, uh, that's the end of Bhaktivedanta purports. Now, Bhaktivedanta purports. Now, the name Bhaktivedanta may itself sound a little pompous and self-glorificatory. Now, somebody who is, who is the master of Vedanta and knows that Bhakti is the, Bhakti is the end of Veda and there's such a person who is so learned, that's the person writing the purports. So, he could have just used the word Abhay Charan or he could have used uh, Swami, but he had been given a title, Bhakti Vedanta Swami, and he used the title. And he also had the title Prabhupada and he used the title Prabhupada also. So, the point is that Mahamuni is a title which is bestowed upon Vyasadeva and Vyasadeva is simply using the title to indicate the glory of the wisdom that has been given. So when Srila Prabhupada uses the word Bhakti Vedanta, it's a title given to him by his uh, peers, uh, by his senior, senior god brothers during his times. So that indicates that what he is speaking is not ordinary, it's glorious. So similarly, Mahamuni is the title which is bestowed upon Vyasadev and he is using that to glorify the to position and glorify the message that he is giving. So normally if we know who is the author of a book then if we know the author is a very respectable very learned person then we take the message also seriously. So a devotee's concern is to ensure that the message reaches a, a large number of people and the message gets a proper pedestal for reaching that kind of people. And for that if a devotee has to position oneself just as devotees may sometimes while giving classes introduce and the, they may tell their credentials that is not to glorify themselves, not, not to blow their own trumpet but to ensure that the message they are giving gets proper reception. So Mahamuni, Krite, Mahamuni will also, Krite, Krite that is com compiled by him. So this will also be uh, in one other sense that, that you know, he was in his full maturity after he had written all the books when he found that those books were not, neither satisfied, as, did not satisfy his heart and they would not have satisfied the hearts of others also. So therefore he decided to write this book. So in his spiritual maturity as Prabhupada said, that will be revealed in the 5th, 6th chapters of the Bhagavatam. Kim Vaparair Ishvara So Kim Vaparair What else is required? That means you don't need any other book. One book is enough. So what is the special result of this book? What will happen? Now previously it was said that it will lead to tapatryon uh, mulanam that the tapatra will be uprooted. But here, how exactly that will happen? Sadyo ruddhi avruddhite atrakuti bhi shushru shubhi tatkshanat tatkshanat As soon as one hears this bhagavatam, shushru bhi, when submissively hears it, then ruddhi avruddhite avruddhite one manif manifests. Who manifests? That Parama, that Supreme Lord, that Absolute Truth, Vedyam Vastavam, that Absolute Truth, that Bhagavan, Sri Krishna, He will manifest in the heart. Sadyo, soon, Tatshanat. So actually, immediately, without delay. So actually, this is the special potency of the Bhagavatam. Because there's such a pure and power packed message. And especially when it is received through the great devotees, it invokes the presence of the Lord in our heart. And ultimately, that is the purpose and perfection of existence. That actually, 
we want to develop love for Krishna because that love for Krishna will make us satisfied even in this world and ultimately take us beyond this world to the transcendental world where we will also live eternally with Krishna. So therefore, when we understand this ultimate purpose and understand that the Bhagavatam is going to fulfill that purpose, Kimva Parairishwara, why does one need anything else? Why does one need, need any other sadhana? Simply hear the Bhagavatam and all perfection will be achieved. So Bhakti Sanskrit would say that if all the books in the world were destroyed but the Bhagavatam remained, then nothing would be lost. Now this is not an exclusivist glorification. This is a contextualist glorification. So what does that mean? That means other books which lead one to the Bhagavatam are not uh, uh, rejected by this. So for example, Bhagavad Gita which will lead us to the Bhagavatam, that is wonderful. The CC, which elaborates on the Bhagavatam, that is also wonderful. So the point is uh, that this book gives the message of pure love for God and it is that message of pure love for God that is sufficient and one doesn't need anything else when one is aspiring for the ultimate goal of life. So in this way the Bhagavad, the, the mode of approach to the Supreme Lord in pure law, nirmat saranam, rejecting lower principles of religion, dharma prajita kaitavata, and then the result of we, what what kind of absolute truth we approach? We not, not approach a material conception of God who will approach, give us material things, but vasta vastu approach. And then because we are approaching at a spiritual level, we rise to a spiritual level, tapatre unmulnam. And this whole conception of approaching God at a level of pure spiritual love, that is the speciality of the Srimad Bhagavate. And it is the speciality of the Mahamuni Krute, that that sage who wrote ever, many, many other books and then finally he wrote this in his the zenith, the summit, summit of his spiritual evolution. So that book is now uh, Kimba Parair. Why do we need any other book? Because just by hearing this book, the supreme, the all attractive supreme lord, uh, uh, to whom devotion brings the supreme liberation, that lord is manifest in our heart. And therefore, we do not need anything else. So this is the glory of the Srimad Bhagavatam, that if we hear regularly, our goal is not simply to become pandits of Bhagavatam. If we become pandits, that's uh, wonderful. We can use that in the service of Krishna. We can use that in increasing our own contemplation attraction to Krishna. Our goal is simply to, first of all, become lovers of Krishna, to have Krishna's presence manifest in our heart. And that is what hearing the Bhagavatam in the association of the Bhagavatas will enable us to do. Thank you. Hare Krishna. We'll continue in our next session and we'll discuss the third verse. The first three verses we are discussing in separate, short, short, uh, separate half hour classes. And then we'll move faster, taking several verses in one session when we move forward to the later verses. The first three verses are extremely important. They have a wealth of meaning. And that's why they require elaborate discussion. We know that Bhaktan Surakur spoke weeks and weeks just in the first uh, verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Madhusan Sarathya wrote, wrote a full commentary on the first verse, Srimad Bhagavatam, Pratham Shloka Tatparya. So these are very important verses which set the scene, which, uh, set, which determine the mood. And they tell us what is the uniqueness that is going to be found in the Bhagavatam. So we are having separate classes on this first three verses and then we'll move faster. Thank you. Hare Krishna.